Hello, everybody. I'm Terry Fisher from NQA. I'm the principal assessor for occupational health and safety management systems. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the migration of OSAS 18001 to ISO 45001. So, as we begin, if you have any questions, by all means, type them into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and I'll read them as we go through. If we get various questions uh, of a similar theme, I'll try and bulk them together and I will try and answer questions as we go through. There will be a formal question and answer session at the end of this uh, webinar, but by all means type in your questions as we go. Uh, just to be clear, I can't answer individual organisational questions. I can only answer generic questions on the requirements of the standard. I can't give you resolutions to issues or et cetera that's applicable to a particular organization. So just to make that clear, we can only clarify what the standard requirements are for the assessment um, activity. So why implement 45001? The main benefits are driving forward a culture change within an organization, a positive culture change to improve and enhance worker engagement, risk-based thinking with a systematic approach to OHS management, reduce culpability, and at the core of this, the protection of workers. It also aids the demonstration of leadership with a proven commitment to action and ongoing improvement for an organization over a period of time. It should also help enhance performance and reduce risk throughout the activities that an organization is engaged in. As you may well be aware, uh, ISO 45001 is, is based on the Annex SL structure, which is the high level structure that's been introduced by ISO and has been recently applied to other standards such as ISO 9001-2015 for quality management, ISO 14001-2015 for environmental management. And the structure is broken down into, into what you would class as 10 chapters or 10 elements uh, within the management system. The first three um, elements, the scope, the normative references and the terms and definitions refer to the ISO standard itself. So it describes what an ISO standard is trying to achieve with its implementation, the normative references, the things that it refers to, etc and the terms and definitions referred to within the standard. So it's quite a good, section three is quite a good point if you don't um, quite, if you need any clarification on the terms and definitions used, then section three is quite a good starting point within the management standard. From an assessment point of view, we're interested in chapters four to 10 inclusive. So the assessment will focus on those elements, context of the organization, leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, and last but not least, improvement. So the management system process is looking to have an improved culture, leading to enhanced performance, within OHS activities, reducing risk and reducing workers to exposure to hazards as you go through. Section four is the section on the context of the organization. This is where we look at external issues that are applicable to the organization internal issues that are applicable to the organization and activities and the purpose of the organization itself. As we spoke of earlier, 
This structure is applied across multiple disciplines, quality management, environmental management, but obviously the requirements then within each of those disciplines is quite discipline specific. So occupational health and safety interested parties may differ from environmental interested parties, for example. The internal issues faced by the organization for OHS could be different to those that would apply to environment or quality management. And then it also considers the activities and the purpose of the organization. What does it do and how does it do it? And what it intends to do in the future. So the strategic direction of the organization is quite a key consideration within the context of the organization. Within the OHS management system, the core interested parties are workers. And we, the, work, the term worker is deliberately used, not just employees, because it's there to capture external contractors, anybody engaged by the organization directly or indirectly engaged in work activity on behalf of the organization, or that could be affected by the organization. So worker is a key phrase and a key change in terminology used, and it's an all-encompassing phrase, not just about direct employees. It includes agency workers, contractors, subcontractors, etc., all those who may be impacted by the activities. Other interested parties may well include regulators, um, legal requirements, and commercial considerations. So that could be, you know, group requirements various things you've got to achieve and the way you've got to achieve them can impact on the performance of an occupational health and safety management system. So there are various things there that you may need to consider within the context for an organization. These things are probably already well known within the organization, but it's a matter of standing back and thinking why you need to achieve something. What does context of organization actually mean? And it's basically trying to describe what do you do, why do you do it, who do you do it for, and how do you know when those needs have been met, and how can you improve risk management and the adoption of opportunities within the process to get better over a period of time. That's what we're trying to look at when it comes to organizational context and interested parties. In section five of uh, the management system for 45,001, we then need to bring in the leadership elements. And there's a, a distinct enhancement here talking about leadership and not just the management of. So leadership requires direction, strategy, policy, definition of roles, resources, etc., And that's now embodied within the standard to a much greater enhanced level than it was uh, within 18,001. The strategic direction of a business can be very important because that can help define its culture. It can also help define the activities and the resources and the planning that are required within the organization. So it's building in OHS management systems and principles into the daily operation of a management organization, not just the, oh, well, we make a number of widgets, and then, by the way, we've got to do some health and safety things. It's building it into the general requirements of an operation and throughout an organization and the way it functions. We've got our first question in. Um, there's a question here about 45,002, which is basically a, a guidance document that um, is being published alongside 45,001, and it's a supporting guidance document for the implementation of 45,001. So the question was, I cannot find ISO 45,002. Is there one in the pipeline? Yes, there is. 
um, but it is the the guidance of just for those people who aren't aware there is some guidance at the uh, about applications and various things of the existing standard in the annexes at the back of the standard after all the clauses there is some guidance of interpretation there and applicability etc so it can be quite useful to read that in connection with uh, the standard as well as all the terms and uh, things in section three so going back to the leadership then the leadership requirements have been enhanced with regard to the active participation in leadership, the requirements to define roles and responsibilities, and the enhancement of worker participation within the activity of the management system, not just as a matter of, oh, well, we're doing this to you, and uh, you know, you've read and said, do you agree with those, say, a system of work or the risk assessment? It's actually involving workers in the activities and the processes, right up to and including uh, policy and strategy to some extent it's very it's very worthwhile to have some participation of workers at the various levels uh, to get a feel for how the organization is actually functioning as opposed to how uh, some management and leadership may perceive it functioning it's good to get that reaffirmed from the workers at various levels and then use that information to influence where the business goes in the longer term with regard to what it can achieve and what it can do and how best it can enhance and reduce risk. So section five, the leadership section has been strongly enhanced in, in comparison to 18,001 and it's a major element within the management system. As part of some of the requirements of 45,001, there are some um, technical requirements that have been brought in in January 2018 with regard to all management systems and occupational health and safety management systems. With regard to uh, leadership will be involved in the closing meeting. So there will be the, um, the senior manager, the, the senior leadership person required to attend the opening meeting, the person responsible for occupational health and safety monitoring would also be required to attend the closing meeting uh, of an assessment and also worker representatives that have some input into occupational health and safety management. So people that have participated in the process and all have a, a link into the running and operations of the health and safety management system should all attend the closing meeting of uh, management system assessments that's for both 18,001 and 45,001 and they would all, should also be available for participation in interviews etc throughout the assessment process at various points because for example the strategy of the organization and the policy we will want to discuss that with the senior leadership team to establish why it was why it was done what they're heading to do what they're trying to do what their vision is for the for the because it's about the whole point of the management system is about delivering the policy and delivering the strategic direction of the business in relation to enhancing occupational health and safety for the workers so there needs to be that contribution throughout the process The next section uh, is the planning section of the management standard in section six. So this is where we're looking at hazard identification, risk and opportunity, compliance obligations, and OHS objectives. So this section can also link to the context of the organization in so much as Risk and opportunities may be identified as part of the context of the organization in relation to the strategic direction it's going in, where it wants to be, its interested parties, what are they interested in, what's been achieved, what's, what's been undertaken within the organization. 
the main thing to remember is that these elements don't work in isolation to each other. They all influence and impact on each other. As things change in the context and the interested parties, that can have a, an impact on the leadership. It can then have an impact on the planning, the hazard identification, the risks and opportunities, etc., identified within the management system. So the planning element is where you look at the previous elements and say, well, what have we got? What do we need to do? Where are we? A lot of organizations will already have some form of hazard and risk identification mechanisms. It will also look at risks and opportunities. You really want to enhance what you've already got and try and formalize that. So just make sure they don't work in ice or they're not left in isolation. That information needs to influence and impact what's happening within the organization. Obviously, if something's of a particularly high risk or whatever, you may need to take immediate action to resolve and reduce some of that risk. And that can have an impact on the operational needs and potentially the strategic direction of the business. So all these things are interrelated. As well as all that, you've got statutory compliance obligations that may be applicable to you, um, health and safety legislation, legal requirements, but also the requirements of the interested parties. You may have agreements with trade associations. You may have local agreements with worker groups and various things like that. So it's understanding those needs, identifying that, ensuring you've got mechanisms in place to capture those needs and those, when they change, etc. And it's an ongoing cycle. The context of the organization is quite a dynamic activity and can change potentially on a daily basis. You know, for example, if a manufacturing business gets a very large order in and that then requires, and, and somebody accepts that order and, and then that re then requires a doubling up on certain processes or working shifts that wasn't normally worked or working additional hours or weekends, etc. All this has an impact on the workers and the operations and the various groups. So that all needs to be considered as part of the management system and the day-to-day -day operations of an organization. It really is about the connectivity of the various elements. Although there are clauses and requirements for each, it's important to look at the interconnectivity of the various elements of the management standard and see what needs to be achieved. Compliance obligations as well as statutory, could, as I say, could come from other organizations, could come from within. So you may have a parent group that says, right, we want you to do things in a particular way. So that becomes a compliance obligation. It's not a statutory obligation, but it's the way that organization wants you to develop and wants you to work towards. Uh, I've had a question in about expanding on uh, OHS opportunities. So opportunities, just to answer that very briefly, can include actions that you've identified to reduce risk. So there may be, oh, there may be an opportunity then to review a process or an activity, and it may be the elimination of a particular hazard or chemical or whatever, and either eliminate that from, from the process in its entirety, and that can give you other advantages as in, it may make it then easier. Oh, well, if we don't have that chemical in and we can find an alternative, then that would mean we don't need to have the specialist storage activities, et cetera, et cetera. So that those are development opportunities within a management system based on uh, actions and, and opportunities there. But opportunities can also arise. As you may well look at um, changes in technology, and it could be that traditionally you've always done a certain thing in a particular way, and technology may have changed and moved on. So, and that technology advancement may enable you to do it in a completely different way. Um, one of the things that's uh, coming into the fore over the last few years is dr use of drones, etc. If you if you think about occupational health and safety, there's a, there's a lot of work and at height done for inspections and hazardous enclosed environments. 
and increasingly now due to technology change drones are used in place of people having to enter these areas or go up into high levels and drones are used with the various uh, visual uh, monitoring to aid that process it may not eliminate it in its entirety but it aids that process and reduces the risk it reduces the, the human exposure to that risk so there are opportunities based on technology and on actions and activities and ongoing improvements within a management system so everyone can can have the discussion about you know we've got this risk and actually if we address this risk that gives us an opportunity it may free up space it may free there's all sorts of things that can come from looking at your activities and, and reviewing what goes on from the risks than the hazards that you currently identify. And it may snowball into something bigger than, than you initially anticipated, or it could be more subtle and, and, and smaller changes can make a, a huge impact on risk within a particular activity or an environment. So it really depends on the organization and the commitment to enable change and encourage this participation of people contributing to um, the improvement activities of an organization, which is key really. So you've got the legal compliance and other uh, obligations in there. And within section six, the planning activities, you also then need to consider some OHS objectives, which may be related to the context of the organization, the strategic direction, the risks and opportunities. So you may set some objectives to reduce particular high risks or eliminate risks in their entirety, change from one technology to another because it gives advantage. And these are the types of objectives that we'll be looking to see the linkage, both not just as objectives, but why have you made those objectives? What is that linked to? And, and seeing that management process uh, take shape to deliver objectives and continual improvement going forward. As well as setting objectives, you also need to consider how you're going to achieve those objectives. It's no good just saying, no, we want to, you know, want to have a, a zero harm. Uh, organization which is a great ideal to aim for and to work towards but what are you going to do to achieve that what areas are you going to focus on how are you going to measure your achievements going forward what resources will you need so it's that planning process behind the objectives of how you're going to get there what's the plan what's the resources what's it what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and how we're going to measure the various stages of how we progress down that road of OHS objectives and achieving them. So it isn't just a simple ideology of just setting these targets and, and then wishing and hoping that you'll achieve them all the time. There does need to be some substance to that because it, it does need a level of commitment, both in terms of resources, time, etc. Uh, from numerous parties potentially and you need to understand that and you need to understand what that is and it's also about making people responsible for various elements of their objectives and you can't make people responsible if you don't inform them what they're responsible for and what the expectations are so it all links in to the roles and responsibilities and planning for continual improvement and achievement of objectives overall In section seven and eight, we're looking at the resources and the support requirements leading to the operational control. So section seven looks at the resources, the competence, the awareness, communication and the documented information needed. So a recent development in terminology is the documented information. Um, that is all inclusive, so it includes information on databases, this, that, and the other. It doesn't also only refer to hard copy documents as traditionally was perceived. So documented information can be anything within the organization. And a lot of the documented information and uh, things, data that you will use won't necessarily have the title of occupational health and safety data or occupational health and safety information. It could be commercial business uh, information that you can use 
in relation to um, documented information. And all that needs to be used and analyzed. What level you need, to some extent, is defined by yourself. There are certain requirements within the standard things that do need to be documented, but the level of documented information should be there to support the achievement and the outcome of the requirement. When it comes to resources, then obviously resources are required. And this is about leadership commitment, linking back into that. You know, the leadership must authorize some resources, must see the value, know what it's trying to achieve by having those resources. Competencies, so not just having the resources in terms of humans and people power, it's the competencies, have people got the skills, the competence required to achieve what is the desired outcome from the management system? Will they need support? Will they need training? Have they already got the necessary competencies? Competencies can also lead into legal and statutory requirements. Uh, as an example, I'll use GasSafe as, as an example within the UK. To work on a system, you need to be technically competent to work on a, a, a live gas system within the UK. You need to hold various competencies to be authorized to work on gas systems. And therefore, there's a link to your legal and other requirements via that route when it comes to competencies. And there could be numerous things there that an organization may need to consider. The organization needs to look at, its, at the competence requirements, what it's trying to achieve, what technical requirements are there within the competencies, and it needs to define those competencies so that people can either be brought into the organization with those competencies or internal resources could be developed into gaining the competencies over time. It's also an awareness of the culture and the authority of individuals. You know, people need to be aware that they've got a, um, a right to also take action to protect themselves, to withdraw themselves from significant uh, risk and harm. And all these authorities and roles and responsibilities link in to the competencies and awareness and communication of an organization in terms of occupational health and safety. Communication is a key element in all these things, both in terms of worker participation, but also in uh, emergency preparedness, how you're going to communicate, what you're going to communicate in the realms of social media. Um, you know, communications can be outside the organization's control in the event of a serious incident, for example, within seconds uh, and minutes of that event happening before potentially uh, an organization has, has had a chance to react and respond to a particular incident. So it's worth considering what you can do, how you can help control that, how you can um, use communication effectively, how you can respond to communication, whether that be external um, complaints, how, whether it be enforcement authorities, internal requests, you know, internal communication could include hazard reporting activities, uh, risk reduction campaigns, etc. all working on this participation of workers to get an enhancement and improvement over time. So in communication, as with most things, it's a key element within the effectiveness of the management system. And also in the section uh, seven and eight, we're looking at the hierarchy of control. We're looking at change management. We're looking at procurement, contractor control, and emergency preparedness. So when we're looking at risks and opportunities and, and reducing risk, it's a requirement to use the hierarchy of control, uh, whereby elimination is the, is the primary most effective method, and then working down through the various stages of that. And change management can include plan change. So a plan change could be uh, the holiday season is approaching and various staff members or a lot of your normal staff members are away on holiday at particular times of the year. That's normally controlled. It's either limited to, to enable you to still function 
or you may decide that various areas have a fixed uh, closure element whereby that particular operation doesn't um, operate at certain times because that's a known annual closure or an outage or whatever. All these things are used about management of change and the planned management of change. So the you know the planned change of introducing more workers or less workers, changes in new technology, changes for holidays and holiday cover, changes for sickness and sickness cover. I know they're not planned as such as in the days that people are going to be sick, but you may well have a contingency plan there that if anyone's ill or they've got a deputy, they can, their roles and responsibilities can be adopted by someone else. How is that maintained? Effectiveness, effectiveness over time. It's, if someone's not been into a particular area, but yet there's someone's deputy, think about how that may impact on uh, are they able to undertake those duties at short notice if they haven't been in the area for a while? So it may be prudent to do some refresher training. So that link can link into emergency preparedness, but and that links into change and plan change. There's a whole range of things uh, within that that are key and important steps. Procurement uh, is highlighted there because procurement and some of the sub elements of procurement, including um, control of contractors and outsourcing of um, activities, is a sub clause of procurement in 45001. So therefore, which is a natural link. It doesn't mean to say that procurement are the only people that can have any influence because in most areas, the procurement department or function may be a relatively small function that just does the administration of the procurement process but the inputs into that process may need to be quite technical there may be some legal obligations i'll go back to the gas safe one from a legal obligation so ensuring that you engage gas safe registered engineers within the uk to do gas safe work or other technical requirements that are required for legal obligations then also links back to competence so the whole of the process of procurement needs to be thought about and how that interacts because it can traditionally be an area of weakness within organizations is they've got very good controls amongst the direct uh, workers but some other indirect workers the controls are weakened and they haven't gone through due process to check about competence the methods that is going to be used etc you know who's reviewed the method statements and risk assessments that have been supplied by an organization has that been determined as appropriate will they need various other th authorizations permits to work etc so you you've really got to think of, of what that means within your own organizations and how that works within the procurement process so the procurement process per se is not just the procurement department it can have a lot of inputs and, and controls and elements related to that activity. Which obviously then can lead to contractor controls and requirements, going back into communication, awareness, competence, documented information, you know, what makes a, a particular contractor competent to do a particular activity? Well, that needs to be defined uh, by the organization or else why, they, why have they engaged a contractor to do something if they don't know that they can do it or they don't know what they want them to do? It's those sorts of thought processes within the management system. Then you've got the operational controls themselves. The operational controls themselves of a, within the management system are, are a relatively small section, but I would say they're, they're one of critical importance, purely because at the end of the day, the operational control is where the action or where the activity actually undertaken and, and in, in the real world where the risk potentially is exposed. So the operational control is a key element because it's about the effectiveness of that control is what we're looking at in redu risk reduction and the protection of workers. So although it's a relatively small section in terms of uh, amount of wording and, and it's a really key component of the management system and its effectiveness because the best systems in the world theoretically 
they're no good if they just sit on the shelf and they could be really well written and they can be really well done and they can be really well meaning but if it isn't actually adopted and implemented then and it doesn't deliver that operational control then you know all that work has been wasted so it's about making the operational elements of the management system effective and reducing risk as you go forward and obviously as part of that uh, risk and, and operational control process there may be things that you may identify as potential emergencies and it may not be something that you've experienced directly but you think well it's a potential that could happen and we need to give it due consideration uh, as part of the hazard and risk assessment process within the organization and you should make contingency plans for uh, emergency situations um, a common one for example is fire so it may be applicable within your organization to have fire equipment and to have fire training and to have evacuations and drills and various things with a view that you may never need these in anger you've got other systems in place to prevent fire from happening so but you still make preparation for fire within your management system and this is about emergency preparedness fire is only one element there could be numerous depending on what your organization does and, and what its activities are and where it does them etc because it could be the location you're in that could generate a potential uh, risk and an emergency situation flooding for example and that can bring its own hazards and, and issues with regard to not just environmental but occupational health and safety as you go through then in in sections 9 and 10 we're looking at certainly section 9 is the eva uh, evaluation and improvement process and monitoring so we're looking at the traditional uh, internal audit process and in relation to occupational health and safety you you can apply some risk based methodology in that in so much as you need to if you've got um data and information saying you've got concerns about a particular activity or a particular um, performance level within an area that's causing you concern you know you've got a higher accident rate than you would normally expect or it's higher than than other areas then common sense should apply whereby you may look at internal auditing that more frequently than somewhere that's let's say of a lesser risk or a lower performing uh, incident rate etc etc so it's about using the information that the system is generating and all this data and information and it may not be accident or whatever information it could also be uh, occupational health site considerations so noisy environments um, occupational health uh, data and information from coming from surveillances you know there could be a particular issue on skin for example or occupational respiratory um, conditions that may be applicable within certain areas display screen equipment could be a, a major concern to you in, within your operation and depending on what you do so all these things should be influencing the internal audit process and what you check and why it isn't just about confirming that the management system is functioning but it's also looking at are the controls appropriate in the area are, the, are we doing what we think we're doing or are we doing what we are we doing what we say we're doing or are we is the actual operation different to the, to the perceived controls are the controls actually delivering the benefit and controlling the risk that we think they are they may not be a lot of organizations suffer from where we think it's done in this way um, and then actually when you go and audit the process and the various things the activity is completed in a con, in a totally different way uh, to how the controls would indicate and some of the controls may be being bypassed some of them may be being compromised some of the controls may be enhanced because of the new working methods that are being deployed so it isn't always a negative and this is where you really need this worker engagement to have an open and honest culture whereby that can be disclosed and you can discuss and and you can work together to make things improve over time Then there's the incident and corrective action uh, scenario whereby you need to look at uh, incidents and, and, and learn lessons from implement improvement and corrective actions over that this is where opportunities can arise from training and various things 
as you go. Um, but it can also be not just incidents, but you know, this communication, these hazard reports and whatever could be, you know, somebody's made a suggestion. Are those rather than waiting for the incident, which is then a reactive response, you can be proactive and use a hazard report very positively to investigate something and say, oh, you're right, that does exist. What can we do about it? And develop a way forward and improvement over time. So it isn't only about incidents, it's about corrective and improvement actions going forward throughout. So you want this open participation culture. You want to understand people's concerns, both of interested parties, but there needs to be a link to that operational. How could that impact on your operation? Is that a justified concern? Is it not? Is it something you've already considered? Are the controls that you've got already, are they effective? Do they need re reviewing, enhancing? Do they need reducing because of a change in technology? Has something changed? And therefore, a risk may have been eliminated that you may not have considered directly. And also, when you're implementing actions, you need to review um, the risk and the potential opportunities of the actions themselves before you implement them. So it's no good implementing an action to, let's say, overcome a trivial risk. And by implementing that action, you actually introduce a greater level of risk to an operation or an activity. So you need to think about that before you just react blindly and say, oh, yes, we'll just do that. You need to review that implementation of that action with regard to risks and opportunities. And when you do implement an action, you need to then review it over a period of time. Did it deliver the benefit that we thought it was going to do? Did it eliminate the, the hazard? that we, Did it reduce that risk that we thought it was going to do? Have we considered all the knock-on consequences of that change? Have we, have we captured that? Are there things happening that we didn't consider? Do we need to do anything further? And if it isn't delivering the benefit that you originally thought, you have to go back and start the cycle again, look at it again. You know, it's not saying, limit, you know, remove that action. It may be then, oh, there's further work required to, to it's not delivering all that we thought it was. It may only be partially delivering the, the improvement that you needed or the benefit that you identified. So in relation to, to incidents and, and actions and, and information and various things, it's really important to have clear communications, do investigations that are open and truthful, get, try and understand what the root cause was of various incidents and accidents was, not just the, oh, well, that couldn't happen because we've got a procedure that says you can't do that. Well. A procedure may not have been uh, followed. You've also got to understand the human behavioural elements of, of occupational health and safety. Why did somebody decide it was all right to do that? What enabled them to think that that was um, the right thing to do? Physically, how was they able to do that? Can we do something to prevent that physical activity going forward using the hierarchy of controls? So you can see from what we're discussing there, it's a whole element linking back into other elements, training, competence, hierarchy of control, um, operational control, all the various elements of the management system when it comes to incident and corrective actions and improvement activities. Then there's the management review element, which is looking at the management system overall. Is the management system itself delivering what you wanted it to do? Is it working the way you wanted it to work? Are there any changes? Have we got suitable resources? Have we, in terms of competence, do people understand? <coughs> Excuse me. So all these things need to be reviewed as part of the management review. So a management review is very different to an operational review, although an operational review for an organization may well include the management, some management review elements. A uh, management review is specifically looking at the management system and the effectiveness of the management system overall and looking at what you've done, what lessons can be learned, various bits of uh, performance in terms of corrective action, number of incidents, types of incidents, actions, whether they be effectively implemented, whether they're being actually closed out. It's no good creating a long list of uh, corrective actions and then nobody actually actioning them and implementing them. 
Um, so if they're not being effectively implemented and then reviewed, there are issues there. So you've got to analyze the information that's being generated by the management system uh, to see whether the management system is effectively being implemented overall and then make changes based on those uh, requirements and the needs of the organization because over time, the needs of the organization and the context of the organization can change strategic direction interested parties etc technology all can have its influence and that needs to be uh, brought in to the management review scenario to make sure that the system is delivering the benefits that you intend it to so that's delivering of the policy achievement of objectives and looking at legal and other compliance requirements within the management system and overall a reduction in risk and exposure um, of workers to incidents and accidents and looking to enhance that where you can going forward over time. So we'll quickly look at the various elements of the management system we talked a lot about it there in, in, as a system overall. Um, but the starting point for the management system is the scope. And you can't really identify the scope of the management system until you understand the context and the interested parties thereof. So you need to look at the context, who are the interested parties, what the leadership and strategic direction is of the business and the organization. And that helps you then de define the scope of uh, applicability for the management system. If you think about the various companies, a water company, a university, a food manufacturer, all very different in a small en uh, family owned engineering company, all very different, but will all have the context. They will all need to understand what they're there for, what they're trying to do, who they're doing it for, who are the interested parties, as well as the workers and how they're going to achieve that and how are they then going to measure that achievement over time. So the context of the organization, again, looking at understanding what the organization does and why, understand the needs and expectation of workers and other interested parties within the management standard and determining the scope of the management system overall. And there's some general requirements with the management system about what it's trying to achieve. There are various methods of looking at this. You can use a PESTEL analysis and various other analytical um, tools really to, to help identify the internal and external factors within an organization. But remember, this is about occupational health and safety. So you may have done something similar to this for um, quality management or environmental management, but this is specifically focusing on occupational health and safety. So the principles are the same, but the actual application is somewhat different. So the context is different and the interested parties may well be different. So there's some examples of uh, potential interested parties when it comes to um, the trilogy of standards in, in ISO management systems. And you can see workers, managers, contractors, agency workers, regulators, customers, visitors and the public can all be regarded as interested parties and depending on what their needs are and the requirements. So it's how you meet those needs and how does your organization do that for the various things. But there are some examples of what you can cover in interested parties as well as workers. So once you understand the context, then you can define the scope. We've talked about leadership uh, in great length earlier. This is, this is the various clause of the standard, uh, not in their entirety, but just as an overview. So leadership and worker participation, it's looking at leadership and commitment. It's looking at requirement for a policy. All this presentation will be sent to the various um, uh, audience members that have registered for this webinar. So you will automatically get sent um, the presentation. 
so you don't have to scribble loads of notes, hopefully. Um, I've just got another question. The uh, question is, would you advise indexing the SMS in line with the clause numbers of the standard? That's not a requirement of the standard, um, and it's and it's entirely up to you. Uh, in answer to that, it may aid you to do uh, a gap analysis and various things. However, um, it's about the effectiveness of the process that we're interested in. We're not particularly interested in you using the right phraseology necessarily or even the right clause numbers. It's about how does your organization deliver that need and requirement from the management standard and from your own requirements as opposed to um, just numbers and, and titles, etc. But a lot of people find it it's quite a useful sense check um, to at least document the various clauses of the standard and the requirements and titles thereof so they can signpost where the evidence is within the management system. So under leadership, you've got the requirements of the policy there and that needs to be documented. Um, just as a general note there, the, the, the use of the phrase Preventative and corrective action has been revised in these, uh, as you'll probably know from if you've got nine or 14. They don't use the word uh, preventive action within the standard. It's basically because the whole of the management standard and the management system is regarded as a preventive action tool. So therefore, they just refer to uh, corrective actions but you're quite at liberty to use whatever terminology best suits your organization if you've got a culture whereby they still use preventive and corrective actions or various phrases. It's about using the language that means something in your organization. It's not about um, using the language that's just quoted in the standard. So it's not about re-educating necessarily in terms of terminology. Within the leadership section, there's obviously a requirement there for the, for the policy. The organizational roles and responsibilities and, and authorities and the phrase accountability has been dropped from the title um, but people need to understand and there needs to be documented information as to what their roles are what their responsibilities are what authority levels they've got within the organization what's the expectation of them because without that how can they function effectively and they need to agree and, and participate in that activity so without that being defined and documented uh, you, you may struggle and also in leadership clauses, the consultation and participation of workers obviously is a key element of, of an enhancement of the management standard. Not really new, but it's certainly enhanced uh, as opposed to 18,001. And it's about the mechanisms and barriers and removal of barriers, the time and resources, information, communication and training, non-managerial participation in, in various activities and controls, up to and including the policy even, you know, um, you can get some good worker engagement for the throughout the whole of the management system. But you also must remember that managers are themselves workers. So you also need to protect managers and look after their health and well-being. It isn't just about various people at various levels. It's about the whole organization and the well-being. And, and, and it isn't just about accidents. It's about occupational health and well-being so that could include you know respiratory health skin health mental health as well as the physical um, attributes and accidents that can occur we talked briefly before about the hierarchy of control well that's based on the elimination substitution engineering controls and as you go down the hierarchy that becomes less effective that's it's always a good starting point to remember that process. Elimination is the most effective method of control uh, in terms of risk reduction and hazard exposure. So elimination of that is always the most effective and it works down 
to the levels of effectiveness throughout. The planning clauses, as I say, actions to address risk and opportunity. Looks at hazard identification, the determination of legal and other requirements and various things you can see there need to be maintained as documented information. So we will expect to see some support in documented information on hazard identification, risk assessments and opportunity assessments, determination of legal and other requirements, occupational health and uh, safety objectives and planning to achieve them. So it's more than just saying, oh, we, we want to reduce accidents by 50%. So what's the plan? What you're going to focus on? How you're going to do it? When you're going to do it? Etc. Etc. Is a requirement there, and then the plans need to be smart and specific in terms of that. Risk assessments and hazards assessments is one of the primary drivers of the management system, which will influence the objectives. So you may have particularly high activity, uh, high levels of risk in a particular activity. So one of your objectives could be reduce the risk in a particular area, etc. Etc. But obviously, it's go it's going to be at the heart of, of the management system is risk assessment and opportunity assessment. Support, in essence, is uh, leadership ensuring that the organisation needs to provide resources and information and the establishment and maintain maintenance of and continual improvement of the management system. So it's about that training, communication, information, resources, etc. So it's more than just management. It's an active engagement with the effectiveness and the out overall delivery of the uh, effective implementation of the management system. It's not just allocating responsibilities throughout. They need to be actively engaged in ensuring that that is actually taking place. So looking at resources, information, training and support. Within the section seven, as we've said, we've looked at competence. We talked about competence earlier. You've got awareness, you've got communication. Communication, as I say, includes external and internal communication. What, what's going to be retained? How are you going to handle it? How's, who's going to look after that? Who's going to deal with that information? How that's going to work? All needs to be documented and retained within uh, the management system. Operational controls, as I say, it seems a relatively small um, element of the standard, but actually it's a really key area because this is where the theory turns into practice. So, you know, eliminating hazards and, and reducing OHS risk, management of change is covered, procurement now includes general uh, procurement activities, contractors and outsourcing requirements as part of the procurement process as we spoke about earlier and emergency preparedness and response shall be maintained as documented information as appropriate to the organization and its needs. So it's not defining everything that needs to be documented. It's saying you should be able to show documented information to demonstrate you've considered the emergency preparedness and response for your organization. Performance evaluation, there again, looking at this monitoring and measurement and performance evaluation both of the management system and critically the evaluation of compliance because when you've identified all the various statutory and legal and other requirements that the organization you've identified needs to subscribe to then you've got to evaluate that compliance to say well did it deliver that compliance requirement did the operational controls deliver that benefit did that activity deliver our legal compliance or our other compliance requirements that were identified within the system. And you've got to evaluate that separately. It's not just maintaining the legal uh, register up to date or whatever. It's actually looking at, did it actually deliver the benefit or did our controls actually deliver the benefit or did our method of whatever deliver that benefit that we identified there? And that is very different to maintaining up-to-date legal information. The evaluation compliance is a key element of, of the management system. Some of that could be done by internal auditing and internal auditing and uh, 
the program should reflect some of the risks and opportunities within the management system. So if you've got a high level risky activity, you may audit that more frequently than you would a low level activity, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about using resources appropriately and using the mechanisms within the management system based on the risks and opportunities for the organization. And then obviously my uh, management review, made some word changes there, but there's primarily the, the management review requirements are uh, not too different to, to what was scoped out in 18,001. And then the improvement um, activity there in section 10 is looking at incidents, non-conformity and corrective actions. So information needs to be retained as documented information and continual improvement is by enhancing performance, promoting a culture of support, worker participation in improvements, and communicating and retaining documented information to support that activity. So that's very much a, a sort of whistle-stop tour of, of the management system in its entirety. Leadership, as you can see, is what a, a, another core discipline that needs to be uh, enhanced and used within the management system as a primary driver. I think, you know, when you talk about the risk assessments, leadership is another one and potentially uh, compliance obligations would be the third, I think is, and they're the really strong drivers of the management system in terms of the plan, do, check, act process. The inputs to the plan, do, check, act include context of the organization needs and expectations of relevant parties internal and external issues and the outputs hopefully are enhanced performance protection of workers engagement of, of workers and participation a culture improvement and unfulfillment and satisfaction of compliance obligations so that as a very quick whistle stop tour of um, the management system in its entirety um, NQA as a service provider, we can conduct gap analysis prior to formal assessment against various requirements of 45,001, etc. We can aid that process. For uh, existing NQA clients who are already registered to 18,001 are looking at migration to 45,001, we uh, have provided both a gap guide that's available on our website. As I say, for existing registered clients, there's also a gap analysis document, which is uh, a requirement to be fulfilled, uh, completed prior as part of the assessment process for migration. And that's available when you contact us and, and tell us that you're uh, considering migration at whatever point in your um, certifi certification cycle. So if you want to do it at the next visit or whatever, try and give us as much notice as you can so that we can get everything in place, make sure um, that you've got the information and the support that we can provide you with. As I say, 18,001 is still available and will be available until March 2021. So if you need to continue with uh, 18,001, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's still a good management system. And as I say, it can be used effectively up to and including March uh, 2021, but you need to plan uh, for your migration away from that prior to that date. We talked before about um, mandatory attendance of various roles and uh, requirements within the management system that are not specified within the, the management standard. So the management legal responsible for health and safety is, is one of them that's required both as, as part of the assessment process and at the closing meeting. Uh, personnel responsible for monitoring employee health, whoever that be. And worker representatives with responsibilities for OHS, so whoever that be within your organization. All those need to be A, available within the assessment process um, during the assessment visits, and they also need to attend the closing meeting. That's to ensure transparency uh, for both 18,045 against the interested parties so that it's not um, a closed book. It's not 
it's about engaging with the workers and ensuring that that information can be cascaded throughout an organization including the workers so there are the requirements there um, as I say, NQA have developed um, a client gap analysis document, which will be issued to you as an existing client of NQA when you tell us that you wish to migrate um, to 45,001. In addition to that, just to let you know, um, the IAF, which is the International uh, Accreditation Forum, which is the global governing body for all, uh, for UCAS and all other um, accreditation bodies and certification bodies throughout the world um, for 45001 because it is a new ISO standard and um, there has been an additional time added to the migration and assessment process for 45001 and this is to ensure that there's enough uh, coverage for context and leadership etc because of the enhanced requirements within the management standard and also gives us time uh, to look at the gap analysis, etc., on your migration visit. So there is mandatory time being added to the time allocated to assessments for 45,001, which is slightly different to um, 18,001. So if you've got an 18,001 recertification visit that let's say was a day, there'd be a minimum of one additional day added uh, to a 45,001 migration recertification visit. So the practical tips for those looking to um, migrate from one to the other. If you're starting from scratch, uh, read and have available the standard. Identify sources of legal compliance and information and other requirements as, as appropriate to your organization. Review existing risk hazards and risks and what controls and, and what various things you've already got in place. And Consider a gap analysis, both an internal one done by yourselves and also an external gap analysis from a, an external body such as NQA, where we can come along and, 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 and give you some support in identifying any areas of potential concern or weakness and potential opportunities there where you've got some very good practice going on where we can recognize that and, and, and help you understand your business and help you the way forward to develop to the, a successful uh, in implementation of 45,001. If you're migrating from OSAS 18,001, um, obviously have available and read the standard. It seems obvious um, to me, but you'll be amazed at the number of clients that don't have access to a copy of the standard. And they say, well, that's your job. Well, as an assessor, well, yeah, I do know the standard you need to understand what your management system is trying to achieve and, and unless you've got a copy of the standard or have access to a copy of the standard then you know that that could be problematic i'm not saying it is impossible but it is very difficult trying to achieve something if you don't know the set of rules to which you're to what you're trying to achieve so it's always a good idea to have the standard available to you as i say Consider a gap analysis, both internal and external, um, for all the reasons we've just discussed. Look at the mapping exercise of what you've already got within your management system, where you think you can enhance it, where you think it needs development, where you think it already meets the requirements. So look at what you've already got. And obviously for NQA clients migrating, then you will have to A, get a copy of the uh, client gap analysis, which is only available when you tell us um, that you're going to undertake a migration visit and we'll send you that. But there is uh, migration support information on our website for, for, for everybody. Um, so for NQA clients, go on our website. There's lots of support material there. Um, as I say, Planning and preparation, there's nothing to be frightened of. I, I actually think 45,001 is a really good flexible standard. It's there to meet the needs and, and business requirements of organizations. It's not there to, to try and make life difficult. It's identifying the key steps and the key processes that you need to undertake to effectively implement 
an efficient and effective management st standard throughout. So don't be frightened of it. It's a really good standard. There's lots of flexibility there. You know, the challenge sometimes is the terminology used within the standard, but hopefully this webinar today has helped clarify some of that um, potential misconceptions regarding the, the terminology used. It's not about the terminology, it's about the effectiveness of the processes and the level of protection that you um, provide for your workforce and your workers throughout. So that's what we're interested in, effective risk reduction processes and effective control of processes in relation to occupational health and safety risk. So, I don't think I've received any more questions. There is a question here about um, when there's a hazard identification risks, etc. Uh, assuming that risk assessments and safe systems work are in place already, what cover would this cover the need or separate documentation for hazard identification? No, it's about the effectiveness of, of what you've already got. If you feel it's effective and it's currently and it's reflective of what your risks and opportunities are within your management system, then that's fine. It, it could it could well be working um, um, without revision, but it's for you to to look at that and ensure that it's uh, effective. When it talks about hazard identification, there's also risks and opportunities when it comes to strategic direction and context and various things. So you know. The company might be thinking of buying another business and, and linking that. So that as a strategic objective could be a risk and an opportunity. And that needs to be considered in relation to occupational health and safety, as well as the direct operational uh, risks and opportunities that you may have. So there's the differing levels that need to be considered. But you, you, there's nothing to say that your existing um, system isn't providing that at an appropriate level. But it's for you to do to look at that and, and, and you've got to feel confident that it's, it's delivering what you need it to deliver as far as um, your hazard and risk identification process is concerned. I don't think I've got any more questions. So. If you're all quite happy, um, as I say, the presentation will be sent out to all of you that have registered. It's also been recorded, uh, so you can listen back to it if you were unable to um, participate directly. If you've got any um, generic questions about interpretation of the standard um, in relation to NQA clients, etc., by all means, you know, give us a ring. Send us an email uh, where we can. We'll give you generic guidance as to the interpretation of the standard. We cannot consult. We're not allowed to uh, describe what you need to do to achieve the requirements because that would be a conflict of interest on our part and, and it would be a contradiction in terms because we then couldn't come in and assess your... If you've done everything we've told you to do and then we come in and assess your management system, it would be a conflict. So that's why we're not allowed to consult. But we can give you um, interpretation of the standard requirements and we can discuss, you know, what the standard is trying to achieve and why it's trying to achieve it. But we can't describe methods in which uh, you can achieve that directly for your organisation. So if you have any questions, by all means, contact us. Thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. and. Uh, Keep safe and keep well, and thank you very much. I'll see you in the not-too-distant future.